Hello and welcome everyone to Seattle Boat Show Live Season 2, Episode 7. And George Harris is with us. He's filling in for a Peter Trappen, who's off in St. Louis. And Mark Bunzel is also off. He's on another engagement. And Leonard and I are here in beautiful uh, Juneau, Southeast Alaska, with some fabulous weather. It's sun shining, the skies are blue, and we've been having a great time. And George, what have you been up to? Oh, hi, Lorena. Hi, Leonard. Thanks for having me. Um, been busy here at NMTA as we turn the page into a new fiscal year for the Trade Association. And uh, big news is, is the 2022 Seattle Boat Show applications are going to go out to all 700 of our members uh, next week. And a little bit of a change for the Seattle Boat Show. First, um, for the NFL fans, the NFL went to a 17 game season. That's uh, one more than 16, which it's been. So the show dates are going to be a week later in 2022. We're planning for an all, uh, all in-person show. So the dates are going to be Friday, February 4th to Saturday, February 12th. And then the Super Bowl will be on Sunday, February 13th. So those are the dates. And then um, we're going to be indoors and afloat again this year, like we have been for 17 years, uh, but it's going to be indoors at Lumen Field Event Center and a float at Bell Harbor Marina uh, on the Seattle waterfront with the Port of Seattle. So we're really looking forward to that. We like working with the Port of Seattle. And then our friends at the Northwest Yacht Brokers Association that ran the Boats Afloat Show at South Lake Union, they're going to move their afloat show to April of 2022. So we'll be doing indoors and afloat at Lumen Field Event Center and Bell Harbor. So that's keeping us busy. And then uh, speaking of seattleboatshow.com, um, all of the Seattle Boat Show live uh, content that we're watching right now and the recorded episodes next week, that's going to move over to seattleboatshow.com. Right now, for the last year, for season one, it was on a website we created during the uh, Stay Home, Stay Healthy start of the pandemic um, called Open for Boating. So everything's going to move over to seattleboatshow.com uh, for the schedule and that sort of thing. Um, so, Lorena, we, we did this together uh, last month was the... Um, San Juan County um, Southern Resident Killer Whale Stakeholder Meetings as the uh, county commissioners there wanted the county to take a look at, is there anything in addition uh, that the county could do to protect the SRKWs uh, in addition from what the task force did? And I served on the task force. And so we met uh, two long meetings um, last month. And uh, in the end, there was a recommendation to have um, a go slow zone created between Limekiln Point and Salmon Bank. So uh, county doesn't have any, I guess you could say, authority to, to put that in place, but they're going to, after some review here for the next few months, they're going to likely recommend that to the state and to the federal government to consider making a, a required go slow zone from Limekiln to uh, Salmon Bank. So I don't know if you got anything else to say on that, Lorena, you were part of that task force. Yeah, keeping the speed down is a good move for the whales and just being aware that they're there that they're there quite often so that was why it was discussed and proposed and uh, the group consisted of uh, representatives from all uh, sides of the boating industry so that was good yeah the second evening it got a little dicey we had some you know some um, excited conversation I guess you could say about um, you know, some folks thinking uh, we were going too far, some folks thinking not uh, too, not far enough. But in the end, I think uh, we landed on 
a, a good spot. So um, I always like to talk about the whale warning flag. Uh, I'm going to be up in the San Juans um, the next couple of weeks. And this was reinforced during those, uh, those stakeholder meetings, just how important it is for boaters to use these flags um, uh, when you're on the water up there. And if you're in the pr presence of any whales, SRKWs, grays, minkies, or what have you, slow down. And if you can uh, put this flag up, uh, it's really um, uh, supported by the professional whale watching boats. All the scientists up there think it's the right thing to do. And um, uh, when we get a little later in the agenda, I'll put a link into the chat where people can uh, go to the San Juan County website and order theirs, or you can order them from Fishery Supply, but really the right thing to do. I like flying it when I'm up there. Um, Andrews Bay, go ahead. Lorena? I was going to say, you're probably off going to be going fishing, salmon. That's fishing. right. Personally, July 1, salmon fishing in uh, Marine Area 7 opens up. So I'll be there and my out of office will be on for eight days. So July 1 to July 8, um, I'll be up there looking for some hatchery uh, fin clip Chinook salmon. So looking forward to that. And then uh, this week and a little bit of last week, uh, we've really activated with the Recreational Boating Association of Washington uh, to save Andrews Bay. So um, I'm here at the NMTA office in Seattle. So just a little south of here at the south end of Lake Washington is the only anchorage on Lake Washington where boaters can anchor and spend the night. And it's an absolute gem in the middle of this urban um, area. And uh, it's very popular and it's become very popular just like the San Juans during COVID and the citizens in around Seward Park, uh, the little peninsula that comes out uh, at the south end of, of Lake Washington, uh, the, the citizens there are concerned that there's some boaters there that are making too much noise, um, not anchoring within the buoy line. And um, they have reached out to the city saying, we need some regulation there. And in fact, we'd like to see no boats anchored in Andrews Bay. So we, we think that's not needed. You know, we've got a small number of boats that are, uh, I guess you could say misbehaving. And uh, so teaming up with the Recreational Boating Association of Washington, um, we are asking boaters to pledge to be good boaters in Andrews Bay. Uh, so it's a pledge to save the bay. We need to save Andrew Bay. We can't lose this gem. And uh, I'll put a link. Um, I checked in with uh, Arbaugh just before we started this call and um, we've already got 350 pledges, 350 boaters that have pledged. I'd like to see it get up to a thousand. So hopefully all the viewers tonight can click that link. It's just first name, last name, I take the pledge and then a um, little incentive. Somebody's gonna win a $500 West Marine gift card. So a little incentive there uh, to take the time to do it. We've already, done, we've already done our pledge on that. And then uh, I just wanted, to, it is a unique place. It's unique that it's a metropolitan located anchorage. And to me, the, the analogy, the, the, the one that's similar to that is up in uh, False Creek in Van Vancouver, BC. And very similarly in a, a metropolitan area and they had quite a few problems with that. And uh, they put in a program there that, that addressed the problems and it's still a good anchorage now. It's uh, one that we have used and it's right in downtown Vancouver. And it certainly seems like Andrews Bay is one of those things that we should definitely keep and accessible to anchoring boats. Yeah, so I just put the link. Uh, we're using something called JotForm. Uh, just click on that link, a uh, little explanation of what the pledge is about. And first name, last name. If you want to put your email in there, you can, and then you can get updates on the project. But uh, really uh, hope that uh, we get uh, some more people taking the pledge tonight. Folks can anchor for the day in Juanita, but not overnight. So Andrews Bay really is a special place and important to protect that area with uh, responsible boating and for the future anchorage. So I really appreciate what NMTA is doing on that NARVA. That's great. Thanks, Lorena. And I just put in the chat uh, the link to the whale warning flag with, with San Juan County. A few more updates. Uh, we have a great show tonight uh, about uh, boat yards and how they operate and what boaters need to know and, and some of the challenges. But before we get to our topic, we do have a few updates. And uh, starting with Washington State, our correspondents, Wagner correspondents, have been out cruising and collecting updates 
and Dale and Kathleen Blackburn report that uh, there'll be no salmon bake or uh, dance performances at Tillicum Village on Blake Island for 2021 season, but the Longhouse Cafe is open for boaters and campers and Argosy is running a fast ferry service to the island. So keep that in mind for an outing. And then the uh, correspondents, Janine and Nick Mott, they report that Harbor Pub and Harbor Marina in, on Bainbridge, that's a popular pub, they now accept families. So if you're going out with your family, uh, keep uh, Harbor Pub at uh, Bainbridge in mind. And then Arabella's, they've not been accepting moorage for a number of months. They are now open for guest moorage and uh, space is limited, so call ahead. And again, uh, use the self-check-in box there at Arabella's. Uh, Foss Harbor Marina is also accepting guest moorage now, and that's by reservation. So there's the, the side note on that one. Uh, and these, by the way, are in the wagonerguide.com forward slash updates in the updates table. And uh, we just made these changes and that those two marinas were the last two marinas uh, in the South Sound area in the main Puget Sound area that had any limited or closed status. So it's one of those messages about uh, there's the, the returning to normal is in sight here. And certainly with marinas in the South Sound area and the Puget Sound area, those are back to normal. And so we have nothing on the table that is closed or limited at this point, except for uh, the, um, out on, on uh, Macaw. Macaw. Yeah, the Macaw tribe areas, as far as we know, it's still closed. But other than that, everything's pretty much open and back to normal status. And if you're in South Sound around Anderson and Ketron Islands, there, there will be a military airborne drop scheduled for Monday, June 21 from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So be aware of that. And uh, might be fun to watch, but well, keep your distance. <laughs> well, that's one of those where I, I keep, re we keep reporting this and it's one that I, I have yet to see this, but, and you're supposed to stay away from it, of course, but from a distance, I would love to see some of this. It must be something <laughs> very interesting where they're dropping. Uh, I, I think they're military people that they're dropping into water or seals or something that's going on at that, at that point. It sounds interesting, sounds but fun. stay away. Yeah. So. <laughs> And if you're wondering about fireworks for the 4th of July, heading out on your boat, it's been a challenge for communities and marinas to schedule ahead of time uh, due to the COVID and not knowing what would be allowed and uh, having to order your fireworks from fireworks uh, suppliers. But there are folks uh, that have gone ahead with their plans and others have canceled for 2021, but here are some places that you might want to go to on the 4th. The, they are having fireworks. That's Bellingham Blast Over the Bay, Blaine Old Fashioned 4th, Edmonds in their Civic Field, Everett uh, Over the Bay, and Friday Harbor, Rock the Dock, they're having their fireworks. Port Orchard is uh, scheduled for uh, actually July 10th. And then Roche Harbor, they're having their fireworks on the 4th. So uh, you have some options there. You ready for Alaska? And sure, Southeast so, Alaska. Uh, some updates for Southeast Alaska. It's active here. Uh, recreational boaters are here. There's a number of pocket cruisers, uh, cruise boats that are plying the waters here. And so we're seeing a few uh, passengers from the pocket cruise ships. Uh, we're seeing uh, it's active, things are happening, but there's still space. It's not overly crowded, it's not crowded per se. Uh, at the anchorages, we're finding other boats, uh, in the popular anchorages. We were into Thomas Bay, there were five other boats in, uh, in, in the Ruth uh, Island anchorage. Pybus Bay at Cannery Cove, there were four or five boats in there. Holcomb Bay, which is the, kind of, is the anchorage if you're going up to Tracy Arm or Endicott Arm, and again, there were about four or five boats in there, but still space, so space for more boats. The, the other one up here is that it's great picture taking right now because they had a heavy snowfall over the winter. And so there's a lot of snow fields left and uh, some of those snow, uh, the, a lot of snow capped mountains as well as snow fields that come in some cases are coming right down to the tidal lines 
that are left. And we're still, we're here in the, of course, the middle of June, and we're still seeing quite a bit of snow fields. So it's very, it's great for taking pictures, a lot of scenery. Uh, this, the other one is that we've noticed that the cell coverage continues to improve here in Southeast Alaska. It's almost to the point where it's continuous on some of the uh, straits and passages. There's still some gaps between the major cities, uh, but they keep filling it in somehow. I don't know the technology that makes that happen, but it's wonderful. Uh, we get cell and data uh, coverage in uh, most of the passages. Pibus Bay, we were into Pibus Bay. It's a beautiful anchorage and Cannery Cove. And we, uh, one of the, our objectives there was to check with the Pibus Point Lodge and that's the first class fishing lodge that's right there in Cannery Cove. And uh, we confirmed that indeed the lodge is still accepting requests from anchoring boats nearby. Contact them on VHF, VHF 16 or 73, 73. And you can request uh, to, add, to uh, ask whether you can be added to their dinner guest, uh, guest list. Uh, or, and again, this is on a space available basis. So if they have space uh, for guests, for boaters that are nearby, they can accommodate you. Uh, we, it's not your, uh, again, it's a space available basis. So they mainly, their main clients are their fishing lodge guests. Uh, you can give a call. We tried, they were, we happened to pick it on the wrong night and they had too many of their fishing guests there. And uh, unfortunately they didn't have room for us, but it's a first class place, give it a try. Um, we're here. Juno, and uh, Juno, of course, there's no, the huge cruise ships are not in port. This is the same in Ketchikan too. It was one of those unique opportunities to take pictures of the waterfront where you can actually see the waterfront and uh, you don't see the huge cruise ships. So it's, it's wonderful to see and the soul of the city really comes out and shines through when the, uh, when the gigantic number of, of cruise ship passengers is not in town. Uh, the shops are open. Bars are open, restaurants are open, things are running uh, and they're, it's available. The tram is running, but it's only from Friday, Friday through Sunday. Uh, rental cars are short, uh, in short supply. And this isn't just in Southeast Alaska as we understand it, but here in Juneau, uh, none of the, na the nationals, the national re rental car places at the airport had no availability, no cars available. There was a local uh, rental car that you know, rental car agency that's owned here locally, and they did they do have some cars available, but they're um, they're booked up so fairly well. We did get a car for a couple of days, but uh, cars are a bit of a an issue. Um, the at the harbors here, the fuel. One of the things that changed was uh, there used to be uh, fuel with Petro Marine, and uh, separate, secondly with Crowley fuels and Crowley used to be the only one available in Juneau to, uh, to ships that are boats that can't pass underneath the Douglas fixed bridge, 51 feet. Uh, and Crowley was bought out by Petro Marine uh, over the winter and Petro Marine has not opened, has not yet opened the Crowley location that's on the uh, Southwest area of Juneau Harbor. So right now, the only place to get fuel in Juneau is going to be on the other side of the Douglas Bridge. Uh, Petro Marine hopes to get the uh, other location of it open by the end of the month, but uh, no guarantees yet. So if you can't get underneath the Douglas Bridge, uh, the only other place to, around here is going to be go up, going up to Auk Bay to get your fuel. Um, Auk Bay, the, uh, Auk Bay is, is busy right now. They over the uh, in COVID times, the harbors opened up some of those spaces uh, that are normally a 10 day limit for the guest mortgage. And they opened that up to a longer term because they had a lot of vacancy and a lot of space available. And some of those boats that have been there for quite a while are kind of not, I shouldn't say grandfathered in, but they're in the process of moving them out. So as a result in Auk Bay, there isn't a whole lot of uh, guest mortgage available. There's uh, plenty of, of hot birthing slips here available at the three harbors in Juneau. Give them a call and they can accommodate you. And the last thing I have on my list is a glaciers report. So uh, how, are the, how are the tidal glaciers? What do they look like? And at Lacante, down near Petersburg, there's active calving going on, a lot of calving going on. As a matter of fact, enough that uh, it's one of our correspondents, the, uh, 
the Jeffreys that were in there in there with a sailing vessel uh, reported that they were not able to get past the first S turn, which is partway up the bay. Uh, they were turned back by ice flows in there. They headed back with their dinghy uh, and they made it further, but again, they were didn't quite make it all the way to the face of the glacier on Lacante. The uh, so very active. We had also someone. Uh, it's actually going to be our guest speaker next week. Uh, he's with Dangerous um, Dangerous Waters uh, Adventures, and uh, they were up to the face of it. And he has a fantastic video. He's going to share of a, a huge piece of the a face that broke off of the calving glacier that broke uh, that calved from underwater. What they call a shooter. And uh, it's a fabulous video that he's going to share with that. Uh, so Lacante is active. Endicott, uh, our correspondents, the Jeffreys again, reported they were in there and they reported they got within about, about five miles of the glacier face and uh, they were turned back by ice. So uh, Endicott is active right now and it's tough to get up to the face right now. Tracy Arm, uh, we went up Tracy Arm a few days ago. And uh, the Tracy Arm itself has, was easy to navigate. There's a, there are very occasional iceberg coming down. You can get all the way to the Y intersection where you go to the North Sawyer, Sawyer Glacier or down to the south, uh, easily get into that. And then uh, the North Sawyer Glacier has receded back quite a bit and it's not actually a tidal glacier anymore. Uh, there's, a tidal, there's a terminal moraine that has developed there and uh, the face of it is not nearly what it used to be. So the iridescent blue that used to be there is not there right now on the north. Everybody seems to be heading down to the South Sawyer Glacier and there is uh, intermittent uh, calving going on there but it's not really active right now but there's quite a bit of ice there. You're, it's, it's easy, you can easily navigate up to the face of the glacier or the, the, the safe distance from the face, the face of the glacier and a lot of bergy bits in there. There are seals and seal pups on the ice close, so kind of avoid those, but it's very, very, very pretty. And a lot, a lot of activity going on there. A, num a few other boats were there, uh, but very good. So I think we're ready to move on to the main event here with Phil and George. And Phil Reese is with us. He's the CEO of Seaview Boatyard. We've used their boatyard and have been very pleased and uh, Seaview Boatyard, uh, they've been busy repairing and maintaining boats since 1974. And they have uh, several locations, one in Seattle, Bellingham and Fairhaven. And uh, Phil is a native of Ballard. He inherited his work ethic and business spirit from his Scandinavian ancestors. He's a real go-getter. Uh, he began his career in high school, actually, in 1969, working on uh, boat detailing and rig, uh, as rigger. And then two years later, he started his own Reese Yacht Rigging business and worked as an independent contractor. And in 1974, he accepted an offer to join Seaview Boatyard as a junior partner. And within six years, he was a majority stockholder in the company. And then soon in 1987, he assumed full ownership of the company. So a very successful career on his part. He's owned both sail and motor vessels. He's passionate about boating and outdoor sports. Uh, he's a problem solver, as you can tell. Uh, he enjoys the challenges. He's very uh, passionate, it keeps him busy. Uh, he's an active member and has been active with NMTA for 40 years. Uh, he's a lifelong uh, industry advocate working on behalf of the boating community and marine industry on critical issues, including environmental, regulatory, and government affairs. He's obviously received uh, leadership uh, awards and has been a real inspiration to many. And I know he knows... Uh, George Harris very well, since George is the president and CEO of Northwest Marine Trade Association. And George actually was the boat show director, Seattle boat show director from 1999 to 2009, and then became uh, president and CEO of NMTA in 2009. And George is a lifelong boater and sailor and angler. 
uh, a little bit about NMTA. It's the nation's oldest and largest regional marine association, representing more than 700 companies from stand-up paddleboard dealers to super yachts and everything in between. Uh, members include boat dealers, boat brokers, marinas, boatyards, manufacturers, retailers, and suppliers of boating accessories and services. And I think we all know that NMTA puts on the Seattle Boat Show, the West Coast's largest uh, boat show. Uh, but we, many might not know, uh, they also put on the Northwest Salmon Derby Series, the Anacortes Boat and Yacht Sale, and the Northwest Marina and uh, Boat Yard Conference. And they uh, are very indispensable uh, in Olympia. Uh, they advocate on the behalf of boaters for recreational fishing and tourism and workforce issues. And I didn't know a lot of this until we got more involved. And they had three nonprofit uh, uh, groups uh, to support their mission of increasing recreational boating. They had the Clean Boating Foundation, the Fish Northwest, and the NMTA Health Trust. So. They do a lot, like Arba, and uh, I think most of us weren't aware of all the work that Arba does. And was, uh, oh, we lost It's a big part. So, uh, George and, and Phil, do you want to take it away and tell us all about uh, boat yards and what's required and what we as boaters need to know? Sounds good. Well, thanks for the introductions, Lorena and Leonard. And hey there, Thank Phil. You. Welcome. Thanks, George. Uh, I think we discussed earlier that I was going to be the color commentary, the power Sounds to sell. So take it away, Don Meredith. All right, we will do. Thank you. So, um, yeah, in 2009, I became NMTA president and CEO in June of uh, 2009. And kind of my first um, drama as CEO of the association was around the boatyard permit in the, the fall winter of 2009. Uh, the boatyard permit really changed. So um, I've got a couple slides from a presentation I've used a couple of times about the complexity of the boatyard permit. And uh, I think it'll be a nice foundation to um, share with the viewers what Phil, you know, his business is up against with this, this boatyard permit and all of the regulation. And um, just kudos to Phil. You know, he put a firm hand in my back back in 2009 uh, about doing the right thing. You know, we have a lot of members, we have a lot of boatyards and uh, Phil's way out on one side about doing the right thing and doing it now. And so my job as CEO was trying to get everybody to kind of move in that direction. I always call it kind of a rate of change and, and Phil's rate of change, he likes it to move quickly. So um, let me just share screen here and just kind of go through uh, what this boatyard permit looks like. And then this should be a good foundation uh, for our conversation. So it's called the, the Boatyard General Permit. Um, this is what the cover page looks like. It's, it's actually a federal permit that comes from uh, the federal government and um, it's called the Clean Water Act. Technically, it's the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. So we call it the NPDES permit. It's 59 pages long, uh, the current draft. And um, most boatyards like Phil's hire an environmental engineer, a consultant, to help them understand and comply with it. Because if you're not in compliance, the fines are severe and the consequences can be really significant for, for a business. Um, just a couple of foundational principles that we have here at the NMTA. Uh, we believe a healthy Puget Sound is vital for our quality of life, our economy, and it's critical to recreational boating and fishing. Nothing there that anybody can't uh, agree with. Um, boaters want clean water. These are my daughters. Um, that salmon is the first uh, Chinook salmon that my daughter caught all by herself. You can see the smile on there, how thrilled she is. I want her children to be able to do that in 20 years. Uh, there they are swimming uh, uh, at Susha Island, and uh, we want clean water. And uh, boaters, you know, they're passionate about their boat, like all of us are and all the viewers are. They're also very passionate about the boating businesses they use with. You know, if you're a, a Seaview customer, you're probably a Seaview customer for life, right? They're very passionate. They get to know the, these business owners really well. And um, that came into play um, 
in in some of the challenges we've gone through with the boatyard permit over the years. Um, so boaters, they, they need to use a biocide. They have to have a bottom paint. And generally that biocide is copper. So we're going to talk a lot about copper tonight. And then zinc, you know, we've got our zincs. We've got our zincs, you know, to protect the metals on our boats. And um, zinc is a, a, a another thing we'll talk about tonight that's of concern uh, for, for water quality. And there's alternatives to zinc, aluminum, for example, and, and Phil will talk about that. Uh, businesses, they want clean water. Here's a picture of uh, Phil's yard, Seaview Boatyard West out at Shilshol Bay Marina, aerial view from uh, Google Maps. I'm not sure how current that is, Phil, but boy, it looks awfully clean to me. Nice work. Yeah, it, it is the current uh, configuration. And it's important to note, if I may just uh, interject here, you'll see what appears to be very fresh asphalt there, uh, the black area, uh, the darker color. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the things we have to do. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks, I'm battling a summer cold here. So, but the, the, the reason uh, I'm glad you brought that up, George, because we literally had to move every boat. We had to launch a bunch of boats and move all those boats to the west side so the, this year, this past summer, we resealed the entire yard. That's just a portion. Then we moved those boats back over to the other area and completed the entire sealing of the yard, all to be in compliance with this permit. And so I think um, for Clean Boating Foundation, we um, want to reward the businesses or recognize the businesses that are going above and beyond the permit. And I'd say that's what Phil's doing. And so we gave him a, he was the first to get the de designation of leadership clean, going above and beyond the permit, doing whatever it takes to comply and then some. So um, boatyard owners, um, these are small family businesses, six to 100 employees. They care about the environment and they're really proud of what they do. They provide really good wages and benefits. But sadly, um, <clears throat> the number of boatyards in Washington is decreasing. Uh, in 2008, we had over 100 yards. I think it was actually 123 yards uh, pre-2008. 2010, we were down to 75. 2017, 59. And I think presently, we've just crossed under 50 boat yards. So that's not good for boaters. Um, you know, increases the distance or possibly the expense to get to your boat yard. So uh, that's of concern that we're, we're losing the number of boat yards. Um, I like to describe our industry as an ecosystem, you know, we have boat yards. You can see that they, uh, a couple years ago when I made this slide, they represent 9% of our membership. But you know, you can't have boat yards without marinas, and you can't have marinas without manufacturers, and you can't have marinas without dealers. So the whole ecosystem, and I like to always point out that those pie pieces, they're all about the equal size. Everybody's equal. Everybody's important. And we take out one of those pie pieces and then the ecosystem doesn't work. So boat yards are vital to our, our boating ecosystem and we got to protect them. So uh, in 1997, the first boat yard permit came out uh, in Washington state. And um, when I really got engaged in this topic about 10 years ago, I learned that without exception, the Washington state boat yard permit is the toughest permit in the nation. It is the toughest, and it really comes down to salmon. Our ESA listed salmon and coho. Um, there is some research that shows that they are uh, impacted by copper. If there's an excessive amount of copper in the water, it can harm the olfactory senses of a, of a juvenile salmon. So the first permit came out in 1997, and in red there, the big change was Phil and his other fellow boatyard owners, they had to install a system that captured all of the pressure wash water so it wouldn't go into the receiving waters, Puget Sound or Lake Union or something like that. So no discharge of pressure wash water. Interesting, uh, Phil and I were at a conference in Tampa speaking on this topic a couple of years ago and it was Maryland and New Jersey. Uh, they were up in arms and this is like, you know, 2017, they were up in arms that they were gonna have to now start capturing their pressure wash water you know, so Phil had done it 20 plus years earlier and uh, just show you how far ahead uh, our state is on this compared to all the other states. So there was a, a new permit that came out in 2002. The Department of Ecology tries to put out a new permit every five years and they have something called no backsliding. The permit needs to get tougher every iteration. So this or stay the same. So 2002, um, it stayed the same. 
And then in 2005, things started to get complicated and more regulation. So the ecology inserted a, something called a benchmark where Phil five times a year, it's called a discharge monitoring report, needs to take a water sample coming off of his yard. There's one drown, one outfall where the water comes out and uh, he has a sealed container that he has to take, seal it up, refrigerate it and send it to a laboratory for analysis. And then they send that to Department of Ecology and that data amount of copper, the amount of zinc, the amount of oil in that water is reported publicly on the ecology website. So what's it like taking those water samples, Phil? Well, it's, it's interesting because, uh, <clears throat> for example, this last month, we had very little precip and uh, <clears throat> the permit basically requires us uh, to take it during normal business hours. As an example, we just didn't have enough precip to do that. So I actually instruct my guys to go down there on the weekend in the evening to take water samples. Because what you don't want to get into a situation is get into a process violation. Um, and so, I mean, these, these things are watched very closely. Um, we, we, Seaview Boatyard, I can only speak for myself, are vigilant about the sampling and, and, and also everything has to do with the boatyard permit. <clears throat> and so uh, the sampling is pretty simple, but you gotta have precept. And if you don't have precept, then you have to explain why. So for example, in Seattle, we might have precipitation during the month and in Bellingham, we don't. And that's about what happened in May. So we've all, just to cover our, six o'clock, we actually took a sample in June and are ready to submit just at least to show them that we are working in earnest. Yeah, the process violations might come up again, but um, uh, there are activists, uh, environmental activists that are watching this uh, very, very closely. And um, there's been legal action taken against boatyards. So if you fail to submit a DMR, you're not in compliance with the Clean Water Act or the NPDES permit. So it's really important. And um, the, the permit's very clear about when Phil can take those samples and when he can't uh, based on um, the time of the year. So um, this permit with these new benchmarks and then something called corrective action, if you have an exceedance where if you, Phil's copper numbers were above those numbers there in red, um, uh, if you get seven exceedances in a permit cycle, then you have to take corrective action. Um, and it escalates, and then ultimately it leads to something called um, treatment of your of your stormwater. And uh, uh, what was troubling about this permit is nobody knew what was reasonable, what was attainable. Was seventy seven parts per billion of copper as a benchmark? Is that achievable or not? So we didn't know it was reasonable. So uh, NMTA, the Department of Ecology, and some other entities participated in an ACART study, all known available reasonable technologies. And we looked at three different ways to treat um, the, the stormwater coming off of the boatyards. We looked at electrocoagulation, ion exchange, and passive filtration. And in the end, passive filtration was the winner as the best way, most cost-effective way, most efficient way to filter out the, the copper, the zinc, the oil, that sort of thing. So it's kind of like a, it's the blue box there on the screen. It's kind of like a giant Brita filter like you have in your refrigerator where you put the tap water in and then out comes the clean water. Um, very expensive. Most boatyards are about two acres and um, something like that could uh, be right around $100,000 to install for a boatyard. And then you have to maintain it uh, throughout the year. So um, well, if I if I can just inject one thing and in 08 is when Steve, you boatyards put their system and if everyone recall, uh, remembers what 08 was, that was the, the depth of our Great Recession. Of course, no one told us that when we went to the bank and borrowed a bunch of money to put this in. But, uh, you know, we, we uh, all, all our yards to do the infrastructure and the installation, it's just not just the, the filtration system itself. It's all the things you have to do to develop the infrastructure to accept that. And all in, we, we spent nearly a half a million dollars uh, at all three locations to, 
to what we felt was necessary to be in compliance. So, and you well, were the we first. Have a, we have a question here from the chat that maybe uh, Phil or George, you can answer. Uh, the question is, how do you ensure all boat yards sample accurately or correctly? Is that a question for me? Uh, either well, one of you, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. You want to answer that, Phil? Well, you know how does I'll go with that one. You know, how uh, does um, ecology know that you're not um, taking perfect. some tap water, filtered tap water, and sending it in? So uh, <clears throat> it's an excellent question. It's something that's been uh, a topic of discussion with the Department of Ecology and multiple, excuse me, multiple different meetings. Uh, over the years, candidly, it's an honor system right now, and uh, and my hopes is that everybody does what we do. And I'm not suggest I'm not putting ourselves on a pedestal, but I would just direct anybody that's interested to look at our website. Uh, and there's a feature portion of that about uh, Sea View Boat Yards, namely Phil Reese and Teal Reese's core beliefs and values, and it speaks to that on why we do what we do and why we do it. And so in answer to the question, I know I went off, off the rails a little bit on that, that question, but the bottom line, it, it, it is to this day, an honor system. And, uh, you know, the numbers are the numbers and people are watching those. That's all for public disclosure and people are watching it. So you're, you're hopeful that everyone's playing by the rules and doing the right thing. Uh, for our case, I sleep very well at night because we do it by the book. And then there, there is, go ahead. I was going to say that, that we have another question that's uh, in the same regard or same topic area. How do yeah. you make, uh, how to make sure that the, that you're not measuring pollutants that wash into <laughs> the yard, the boat yard from surrounding uplands versus. That's a great generated. question. That's a great question. And, and. <laughs> Each, each of our yards, um, and obviously the ones that are still, you know, I used to have four yards, and I, and I moved out one of them in, in uh, 2011. It's now a viable boat yard still, and, and that's great, but <clears throat> we battled, uh, and I know other yards have battled with that inflow of pollutants and, and, and uh, storm water in other yards. What well, you got to do it. You got to do, do it through curbing. All kinds of things. And in our case, uh, every one of our yards has a curb around it. And so we're measuring that precept that's generated in that yard for uh, uh, multiple different reasons. In our case, and I can only speak to our case, is that we put curbing all the way around the perimeter of our yards on the inside. Why? Well, because we have a chain link fence. And that chain link fence is galvanized. What do you think's in that in that galvanized fencing? Zinc. I don't want to measure the chain link fence. So I mean, you you do what's pragmatic. You do what's practical. And um, and, and and in some cases, boat some boat yards, including ours at Bellingham, have you know World War II circa buildings. Well, the biggest zinc load that comes into that yard via, in a storm event is off those roofs. So I have media um, totes that are that filter that zinc that comes off those roofs. So it, it, there's there's multiple different scenarios uh, as this person has asked. The point is, is I, and I've described this in many different meetings over the years. You know, we know how to repair boats, build boats, cut boats in half and extend them. And honestly, training water to a spot and curbing it and training it to where it needs to go to be filtered is not that difficult. And I think um, to the question about how do we know that everybody's being honest, uh, you can see it in the data. And I've got a slide here that will kind of show what the data looks like from, from ecology. Um, so anyway, um, after some uh, tough talks with Department of Ecology and some others, uh, the permit was finalized with a, a, 
a daily copper benchmark of 147 parts per billion or 50 parts per billion seasonal. I mean, we are talking parts per billion. Maybe there's some uh, engineers uh, in the audience, but we're talking about eye drops, eyedropper type level, uh, you know, a couple eye drops of copper in an Olympic sized swimming, swimming pool for parts per billion. I mean, we are talking about really, really small amounts of copper. So um, that was the permit we're under op operating under right now there in red. But this is that data I was talking about. So you can see the, the trend lines here. And this on the left side, it's hard to read, goes back to 2006. And this is an aggregate of all of the uh, copper numbers for all of the boatyards in Washington state. So the ones in blue are NMTA boat member boatyards and the one are red are non-NMTA boatyards. And this up here on the far left in blue, we're up at about a thousand parts per billion of copper. This trend line here, this regression line is up at a thousand parts per billion. So one thing about the NMTA member yards, these are the most active yards. These are the yards that are putting the most boats through doing the most work. So this was really of concern. Uh, in 2006, 2008, that uh, we were discharging a lot of copper. But you can see as we became engaged in the process, the trend line started going down. <clears throat> so then uh, as we started to lose some yards, the red yards in particular, the non-NMTA yards, the smaller yards were the kind of the first to, to suspend their permits. You can see that in this next time period from 2010 to 2013, the NMTA yards were now the better yards than the non-NMTA yards. And now our copper levels are down under 200 parts per billion. And so this takes us up to 2013. So the trend line is going in the right way. And so you can also look at this for each individual permit holder. So if somebody suddenly has a major drop off, I think you could see if somebody was uh, gaming the system. And then finally, this is a, a really simple graph here. You can see the yards way back in two, 1998 to 2000 were averaging about 400 parts per billion of copper. We are now down to an average of 25 parts per billion uh, for all of the boat yards in Washington state, which is, I think our industry should be getting a, a gold star or a merit badge for coming so far. And, you know, we know not all yards are working as hard as Phil. He's bringing down the curve, so to speak. But um, this far dot here on the right is 25 parts per billion. So kind of the punchline here is there's a new draft permit out right now that the Department of Ecology released about 60 days ago. And they have lowered the copper benchmark to 15 parts per billion. And we're uh, an organization that uh, recognizes that we need clean water and we need some reasonable regulation. So I like to say um, we're okay with regulation that's tough but it needs to be fair. And we think with this new permit that's come out with a uh, copper benchmark of 15 parts per billion, it's just, that's not fair. It's not achievable for our uh, member businesses. And what's interesting is, you know, just eight years ago with the last permit, the Department of Ecology said 50 parts per billion met water quality standards. So we've asked Ecology, what's changed? Uh, why was 50 parts per billion acceptable for water quality standards on the old permit and, and not today? So the current permit has been delayed uh, to, um, it's actually supposed to say, I think October 1 um, has been uh, delayed for 90 days. So that's where we're at. Um, and then actually one more DMR for Phil to do up to six times per year in the new permit. So um So there you go, you know, Phil. I, I could weigh in on, on one thing here is, uh, well, there's several, but we'll just, you know, we made a commitment um, in 08 that we knew, and, and the graph kind of talks about it to a certain degree. You can see a really improvement in the runoff numbers. Uh, and I, I made a point to NMTA and the DOE. At that point, I think uh, Michael was at the helm. And I just said to both George and Michael at the time, I said, I can't get there without putting some kind of stormwater system in. I, I, I can't do it. We've tried everything we can possibly do. So we knew we had to make a substantial investment to, in our opinion, stay in business. That's all there is to it. And that was our commitment. And I stand by that commitment to this day. 
I know it costs a lot of money, but it was necessary for us to do and it, it aligns with both my core beliefs and values, not only personally, but professionally. And, and I stand by that and, and we're maintaining that to, to this day. Our commitment doesn't stop there. We have personnel at all three of our yards that do nothing but clean the yards all day long. And we feel it's absolutely imperative that we do that to maintain up people. So what do you do with that cost? Well, what do you think? I mean, it's part of the cost of doing business and we have to charge for it. So we have an environmental fee for everybody that hauls out. So, <clears throat> you know, it's just what you need to do to stay in business and to be in compliance. We have a question here about, uh, are there boat yards that are operating that are not permitted? Uh, how does about how does a boater know that a boat yard is permitted or not? So I just put cleanboatingfoundation.org into the chat. So there we um, list all of the certified clean boat yards and then the certified leadership clean boat yards. So that is one resource to see what boat yards are. Uh, we wanted to put in place kind of a market-based decision. So like this viewer here, it sounds like this is important to, to, to that person. So um, cleanboatingfoundation.org, you can see the, the five or six boat yards like Phil that are going above and beyond the permit, doing everything they can for water quality. And then you can see the other ones that are, they're meeting the permit. Well, you know, the other thing is too, if I could just weigh in on that, I mean, the bottom line is uh, I was talking to my son Teal who runs the West yard right now, and I'm pretty much in charge of the North yards and we're partners and we align with what we're, we're supposed to do. And we're in here, we're in for long haul. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, we're celebrating next year, 50 years of being in business. And uh, we intend on being around, I don't know how long Teal wants to do this, but I, I'm still kicking around. According to George, I, I'm still in good shape and still know how to haul, haul boats and block boats. So anyway, I mean, the bottom line is, is that we're committed to doing the right thing and being there for the long haul doesn't come without uh, uh, its costs and, and it's, you know, it's commitment. Bill, can you talk about anoids, how you handle those? Uh, yes. Also, big question. Versus, uh, aluminum. Well, actually, it's, the same. it's, it? It, it's actually a topic. Great question. So uh, back in 08, you know, we put the, we put the, uh, the systems in and then we became aware of aluminum anodes. So uh, I'm going to go to kind of current times. Uh, in 2019, we made a uh, a executive decision, myself and my son, Teal. And uh, we said, we have to stop all do-yourself bottom paint because we just weren't getting the numbers. And, and even with systems in place. Um, and as George and I were talking about earlier today, we kind of did a little premium. I says, I look at when, when and do you want, do you, yeah, why boaters are still walking around the yard they just got to stay above the waterline so they can paint their top sides, they can glass, they can do interior work that be necessarily hauled out. So we still encourage that. That being said, um, uh, we, we could tell that our management of our stormwater was very, it was a steep hill to climb even with our, even with our systems because no matter how hard you try, no matter how many forms you had them sign as far as BMPs, et cetera. I liken it to when you go to a rental store and you get you get a rental piece of equipment and you bring it back 24 hours later. And I guarantee it's not treated the same as if it's your own tool. Guarantee. I can speak from experience on that one. But <laughs> anyway, uh, but my point is that's just the, they, the DIYs don't have that same level of uh, interest to they want to get in and get back in the water and i get that so we just decided now we're gonna we're gonna control that waste stream along with zincs so in 08 we really did a big promo and so we're we're we do mainly aluminum anodes now there's a lot of folks out there that prefer zincs and that's fine but we control that waste stream too because I, as George had asked me today, that stuff falls to the ground. If you're not on it 
and picking it up and putting it in a bucket, that's another source to get to that drain. And, uh, and, and, it, and it loads the system. And uh, we battled with that. Uh, that's why we sealed the yard at West. You know, that yard's been in, in existence for 50 years. And you can't get it out. So we had to seal it in. We vacuum, vacuum. We finally said, enough. We got to seal this place. And it's produced great results because of it. And that's from years of the copper dust. And even though we're sweeping and vacuuming all that stuff, the zincs are a huge contributor. And, and it's probably a lot more difficult to manage than copper, interesting enough. It drives, it drives our media suppliers nuts. And it drives me nuts because it costs a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see a question here. Um, are the regulators taking notice of um, the good work by our, our member boatyards? I would say yes and no. The good news is uh, we have a very uh, open door line of communication with the Department of Ecology and their permit right. writers, but Absolutely. they, but they hear it from all sides. You know, there was a group of environmental activists that I was closely engaged with 10 years ago and a person in their organization in a leadership <laughs> position says to me, George, if it saves the life of one salmon, it's okay with me if every boat yard in Washington state goes out of business. And that's just too extreme, too extreme. But the, this voice, these voices do have the ear of Department of Ecology and they're trying to, to find the middle ground. So I think they've gone too far on the current iteration or the draft iteration of the permit we have right now. Um, you know, one of the things I like to ask um, when I talk to different environmental regulators, whether it's state, county or federal is, you know, what's the best example of an industry that's done more for clean water? You know, yeah. the, the, the problem yeah. is not Phil's yard or my boat or your boat. The problem is Interstate 5. It's the way we live. The brake dust, the nickel, the cadmium, the zinc in these brakes. It is just the way we live. You know, point source pollution when the Clean Water Act was created in the 70s was the number one source of, of, of pollution. Now it's just the opposite. We have throttled the, the point source pollution from industry. So far, it's the non-point source pollution that, that's coming from our roads and our driveways and our parking lots and things like that. So um, fun little story, I sat in on my daughter's AP environmental science class this year, it was on Zoom. And her uh, science teacher in her high school said, boat yards are a great example of somebody that um, are, are an industry that's really doing well for clean water or, or storm water in Puget Sound. So. Uh, kudos to my daughter's high school science teacher. But I don't think we're quite getting all the credit I think we should from, from the regulators. You know, if I just can uh, back up with George saying, you know, he, he had mentioned uh, how Washington State and uh, the boatyards in Washington State are far ahead of any. Uh, matter of fact, there is nobody close <clears throat> to what the efforts we're doing in Washington State. And I know that because I, you know, from being in this business for 50 years, I know a lot of guys throughout the nation and they go, what? You're having to do what? And that's uniformly up and down the East Coast, Gulf Coast, Florida, you name it. Uh, Gulf Coast, obviously, Louisiana, Texas, et cetera, et cetera. They can't believe what we're doing. And I don't object to that. I'm, I believe we're doing the right thing. We're doing a damn good job. Far and away than anybody else in this nation. And and I know that because I've been to the yards, you know, and, uh, and I gave a speech. Well, George and I were at, uh, well, that was when we were in Tampa Bay. But then I also did another thing in, in, in Louisville before it went to Tampa Bay. And I visited, I went to the East Coast and visited, I don't know, two dozen yards. Most of them I knew the guys. They had no clue what we were, what we were going through. So, and I just will add on to this, not, not belabor the fact, but, you know, I have three yards. I compare the outfalls from where they go into the receiving waters of Washington state, which in this case is all salt water. And I can, I can look at my, my outfall, which looks crystal clear. And I even have one that commingles with a parking lot. And my outfall is crystal clear compared to the outfalls on either side of me. So I know just 
just from being looking at the water quality, we're doing a heck of a job. We really are. Great to hear. And I think we have time for one more question and that regards bottom paint and what uh, is coming in the future as far as what's required. Great, yeah. Well, I, I hope we answered the questions about the sinks and the aluminum anodes. I'm a big proponent of aluminum anodes. It's, a, it's healthier for the environment. It's a better price and better for the boat. How can you beat that? So that's off to the, the one side. <clears throat> there are lots of discussions around bottom paint today. Um, and uh, there's hard base paints and, and ablative paints. Um, I come from a camp that I, I, I don't really have a lot of problem with ablative paints. I like the harder version of ablative paints. Um, and, and I like the lower threshold of the copper because it's better for the environment. Um, and uh, the, I'm dead set against high copper load bottom paints. Now, I, I'm not necessarily, that that opinion is not by shared by my brothers and sisters in the, in the if that's politically correct, uh, in, in the business. Uh, but I believe keep your copper bottoms low. You have a, a, an ablative paint that washes off over time when you're boating. Uh, the dilution factor is amazing and, uh, and it's, and it's good for the environment. Yeah. So we were able to, um, you know, NMTA initiated the legislation to phase out copper bottom paint. Uh, we I stand behind that decision, but, um, we learned that, um, uh, and college came to realize that maybe some of the, the substitutes for copper, like echinea might actually be worse for the environment than copper. So um, the beauty of our legislative process and uh, new science is we were able to sort of adapt and change and we were able to um, push back any, any <coughs> talk of a phase out. Um, we really like a model that they have down in California, which is um, um, exactly what Phil was talking about with uh, some paints that um, are allowed with less copper in them. You know, that's what Phil right. wants in his business is, is less but copper. in his and they're very they're effective. Very effective. You know, even uh, George had mentioned, you know, the the cop. I think you were alluding a little bit to the copper-free paint, I believe. Yeah, the and there base. is a there's a um, there's a place for that also, but it's somewhat limited. You can't put copper-free paint on a wood boat. Yeah, it's it's it won't work. So it while it has its place in in the industry and and applications. I, I, it's not a, it's not a overall paint that works in all, in, in all cases. Yeah. So I would say if, if, if there's a viewer saying, oh, geez, I'm thinking about uh, buying a boat or commissioning a boat, putting, what paint should I put on? You know, I want to have maybe something that protects me for the future. Um, you know, I think a, a bladeive low copper paint is likely to what we're going to see here in the future. It's what California is doing and, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, Washington, as much as we love boating here, is relatively a small boating market nationwide, and and we can't isolate ourselves. We thought other paint manufacturers, other regions, or other states were going to follow us in 2011 when we did that. They didn't, and we kind of isolated ourselves. So, you know, if we had a block of Washington, Oregon, California, then you've got a large market for the paint manufacturers to design paints for them. And there's, you know, probably. 80 paints that meet that sort of California standard, that, that low copper ablative category, plenty to choose from. That's great. Well, we're at the hour and so much appreciate you, Phil and George, very enlightening. Uh, I think it's helped all of us understand uh, what you're dealing with and appreciate what you're doing. So thanks again. And uh, we will. With that, we're going to, we're going to sign, sign off. off. We'd, uh, from Juno here, a sunny day, and I understand it's a sunny day down uh, down your way in the Washington area. So again, thank you very much. It was a very informative, and we thank you for your time. We're going to sign off from this side, and uh, hope everybody's back with us next week. Yep. By the way, and what are we, yeah, what's see next you week? next week. We have uh, the Steven? Stephen Mull who takes a flotilla through Southeast Alaska on personal watercraft. Ex uh, 
expedition expedition right. style uh, individual watercraft. So. so it'll be exciting to learn about that, where he goes and how he handles the seas. And uh, I know they're responsible in their tours and we'll learn more about that next week. We just walked past all, there's about a dozen or more of these uh, water expedition watercraft that are here. I think he's just headed out right now with a group that's going to go from Juneau back down to Seattle area. So we'll have him on next week. Thank Great. you, everybody, for joining us. Good night. Have Thank you. Day. Thank you. Good to see you, Phil. Good to see you, George. Bye now. Bye.